if you did a robust study of the headlines, there's not a time when they said the economy was satisfactory. There would not be a time when they said there was no inflation. If it is the input of the news that you want to drive your initiatives, the analysis of the pundits and public opinion people, there will be no hope. So the fact that the nation is in captivity doesn't mean my family should be in captivity. Doesn't mean my business should be in captivity. Doesn't mean I shouldn't live my life. Is my portion, hallelujah, at the mercy of the portion of the nation? Or is there a way I can bypass, I can override the realities of the nation and live my life? Please don't be carried away with headlines. Leaders read between the lines. I'm not carried away by any headlines. Leaders read between lines. Your faith is anchored on scriptures, but your trust is anchored on the nature of God. Your faith is anchored on scriptures, but your trust is anchored on his nature. Your trust is in the one in whom your hope is. So if your hope is me, your trust is in me. If your hope is in your parents, your trust is in them. If your hope is your job, your trust is the job. If your hope is in your uncle, your auntie, your trust is in them. The message you're about to listen to is brought to you by the Enthronement House Christian Center, a church with the mandate to activate and actualize God's royalty in you. Fasten your seatbelt, get ready for a ride as God's servant brings you the anointed word of God that will change your life forever. And now the ministry of the senior pastor, Enthronement Assembly, Reverend Deji Olabode. Psalms 126 from verse 1 to the end. When the Lord brought back the captivity of Zion, we were like those who dreamed. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with singing. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us and we are glad. Bring back our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south. Those who who sow in tears shall reap in joy. He who continually goes forth, weeping, bearing precious seed, for sowing, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. This morning, I want to talk about how to bypass a national recession or depression. How to bypass a national recession or depression. In essence, I want to talk about how to handle or deal with national captivity because if you look at the news lately, it's full of challenges. Fuel is now 1,000 Naira per litre. Dollar is now 920. But if you are matured, you would agree with me. And if, you are, if you've lived long enough, the story has never changed. <laughs> the same complaining about the economy in the news that was true when I was a child is still the same today. On the, if you want to understand what I'm talking about, probably look for, just look for all the newspapers when, <laughs> when 
um, Babangida was the president. Let me begin. Look for all the newspapers when Buhari was the president. No, no, no. Let me start from Shagari. All the newspapers when Shehu Shagari, go and look for, do this research. All the newspapers when Shehu Shagari was the president of the country. 1983, 1979 to 1983. Then look at the headlines about the state of the nation. Then leave that and look at all of the headlines and newspapers when Buari Diagbon were in charge, or Shou Shakari. Just look at it. When Obasanjo, Okay, if you should understand history, go back. <laughs> then look at all of the headlines when Obasanjo was done and handed over to Shou Shagari. Look at all the headlines. Then look at the headlines again when Shou Shagari handed over to, well, he didn't hand over, but when the administration changed from Shou Shagari to Muhammad Buhari and uh, Tunde Diagbon. Just check out the headlines. Then again, go look for the headlines when the Buhari Diagbon administration handed over to the Babangida administration. Just try to do this research. Look at the headlines, the state of the nation, the complaining. Then when you're done with that, look at all of the headlines. When Tunde Diagmo was done, Babangida was done, check out the headlines. Then look at the headlines when Shunekon took over. What they were saying about the state of the nation, the state of the economy. You know it's not any different. Then after that, look at all of the newspapers or the headlines, the TVs when uh, Shonekon was done and the man with the dark goggles, Abacha, took over and look at the headlines. You're done with that. Try to look at the headlines when General Abdusalami Abaka took over and just check out the headlines and check out the state of the nation. And look at the headlines again when he was done and he handed over to President Olusegun Obasanjo for just check out the headlines on the state of the nation, on the state of the economy, the state of inflation. When you're done with that, try to look for the headlines on the newspapers <laughs> when he was done and then hand it over to good luck, Jonathan. You check out the complaints, the headlines, terrorism, this, that, that. So when you're done with the Jonathan administration, try and look at the headlines of the Castina, about from Castina. Check out the headlines, the state of the nation, the state of the economy. If you're done with that, look at the headlines on the if you're Nigerian, that is, look at the headlines on the, this few months, three months of His Excellency, President Bola Tinubu. If you did a robust study of the headlines of Nigeria, there's not a time when they said the economy was satisfactory. There would not be a time when they said there was no inflation. There would not be a time when they said, are you getting that? Listen to me. So if it is the impute of the news that you want to drive your initiatives, the analysis of the pundits, the public opinion people, there will be no hope. Because you may find out that in since the inception of our nation, up until now, 
Now, you could say, okay, but I'm not Nigerian. Well, you could do your math, check around, <laughs> go to the U.S. Check when J Johnson was there. Check when Major was there. Check when, uh, just, just check. If what you want to focus on is the state of the nation, the state of the economy, you will continue to complain till Jesus returns. When our president is done, well, it's going to be the same thing. <laughs> now, my question is this. How can you bypass a nation in captivity and live your life effectively? In Jeremiah 29 verse 7, the Bible says, Seek the peace of the city where I've caused you to be carried away captive. So they were captive in that city. And he said, pray to the Lord for the peace of, for it, for in its peace, you will have peace. He's saying here that the fact that there is a national captivity does not mean you should not personally, individually have prosperity. What I want to focus on briefly this morning is how can an individual, a business, a company, a ministry bypass the recession or the depression or the inflation of the particular nation that they, they belong to? Because sincerely, one of the names given to God in Jeremiah 10 verse 7 is the king of the nations. Who will not fear you, O king of the nations? And so, God deals with nations over extensive periods of time. For instance, in Daniel chapter 9, the first year of the reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolation of Jerusalem. 70 years. My question is this, ladies and gentlemen, this captivity was going to be 70 years. What if you were born in the first year of the captivity and you died in the 60th year of the captivity? What if you were born in the first year of the captivity and you died in the 40th year of the captivity? What if you were born in the first year of the captivity and you died in the 65th or the 67th or the there are people who born, who, who were born and who die through, you see, in that 70 year season that he discovered, some people, that was, it is longer than the entire length of their life. So the fact that the nation is in captivity doesn't mean my family should be in captivity. Doesn't mean my business should be in captivity. Doesn't mean I shouldn't live my life. Is my portion, hallelujah, at the mercy of the portion of the nation? Please pay attention to me this Lord's Day. Or is there a way I can bypass, I can override the realities of the nation and live my life? Please don't be carried away with headlines. Leaders read between the lines. I'm not carried away by any headlines. Leaders read between the lines. See, I, I don't know where I was, you know. Yeah, yeah, I, I went somewhere in the heat of the, you know, they just, they just, uh, uh, they just uh, announced that fuel was this. There was so much complaining online. So I had some guests from the U.S. and I decided that I wanted to take them out for a buffet, you know, to just go and honor them. You know, they ceremonial eating. So I wanted to do some ceremonial eating. When I got to the buffet place, I was shocked to realize that every, look, every possible seat, the crowd rolling in to the buffet center. And I was wondering, but you people said there's a recession, there's a depression, there is inflation. But this thing I'm looking, there's a steady stream of hundreds of people in this hotel paying I want to mention the amount per plate. 
with children, with this, you have to choose what you want to believe. And by choosing what you, what you want to believe, you have chosen how you eventually live. Don't be carried away by news stations. Be carried away by all those kind of things. Be focused on the good news. Amen. What I'm saying in essence is that you can, you, can, you, can, you can live a life that is insulated, hallelujah, from the realities or excluded from the realities of the nation that you find yourself in. However, this will be a function of the news that you choose to believe. For who has believed our report and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? So if you choose to believe our report, the arm of the Lord can be revealed to you. But if you choose to believe their report, their report, then the arm of the enemy is all be revealed. It's oftentimes a function of the report that you choose to believe. Business people will tell you, in many cases, there is more money to be made when there's a disruption, when there is, are you there? Economic, more money. Remember when they said there was COVID? Don't be carried away by the COVID reality. So the news will be announcing how many people died, how many people got COVID. There was no announcement about the billions that were made under the pretext of COVID. They were, you, know, you never see that kind of, so which news, which, whose report do you want to believe? As for me and my house, I've settled that I'm going to believe the good news, not just the news, but the good news. Not just the news. If you look at most of the news in our nation and most nations, it's just blatant complaining. Complaining. And you know, bad news sells. So, they want to grab your attention. If they come and say, somebody just built a house, it's not a good news. Somebody had an accident. Eh, hey, hey. <laughs> that one will sell. So we must realize that we must be selective about the news that we choose to believe because the report you believe is a function of the arm that will be revealed to you. I want to give you 10 keys that if you integrate, it will enable you bypass the recession in any nation you find yourself in. I mean any nation no matter what is happening there. Number one, if you're going to bypass the recession of a nation, you must take personal and corporate repentance for the nation seriously. Both individual, personal repentance and corporate repentance. Personal repentance and corporate repentance. In 2 Chronicles 7, and verse 14, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. He's saying here, therefore, that the condition of your land is a function of your sin, our sin, because righteousness exalts a nation. And sin is a reproach to a people. Later, if I have time, I will share with you that there's a connection between your purity and your prosperity. In the kingdom of God, there is a connection between your purity and your prosperity. In the world, maybe impurity, but in the kingdom, God prospers the pure. And so many times, the condition that is responsible for the dilapidation of the land is the sin, the iniquity, the wickedness of the land. This is why personal repentance, individually, and corporate repentance for the sins of the nation is a key to healing the land. We must, in prayer, in repentance, identify with the sins of the land in order to redeem them because you cannot redeem what you can relate to. So the first thing is 
to change the condition of the land, personal and corporate repentance must be a priority. Must be a priority. In Daniel 9, chapter 2, all the way to verse 20, I can't read all of that because there's so much to give. In the first year of the reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolation of Israel. This was determined. It could not be shortened. 70 years by virtue of the things they had done. Even Nigeria, so much blood, so much corruption, so much evil, so much sin. We always talk much, when we talk about corruption sometimes, I, 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 it's very not, we don't talk about the, we talk about the corruption of leaders, we don't talk about the corruption of individuals. Corruption is not unique to the leaders alone. When, when a bunch of young Christians, young people put, put themselves in room for 90 days doing nonsense, we don't talk about that kind of corruption. We celebrate it. We vote for it. We pray. are you there? When young gen, when drugs are taking over like drugs, we don't talk about that. When gambling is taking over, we don't talk about things like that. Please listen to me. It's not the corruption is not just unique to the leaders. The corruption is everywhere. It's systemic and it's endemic. So to come about a change in the land, we must emphasize personal repentance and corporate repentance for the sins of the land. So when Daniel discovered what it was fixed for 70 years from the book of Jeremiah, he said he set his face towards the Lord to make requests by prayer and supplication with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession and said, Oh Lord, great and awesome God who keeps his covenant and mercy with those who love him and with those who keep his commandment, we have sinned and committed iniquity. We, we, we have done wickedly and rebelled. Even by departing from your precepts and your judgments, neither have we heeded your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings and our priests, to our fathers, to our people of the land. Oh, Lord. So he was, he began to repent. Repentance often precedes restoration. Personal repentance precedes personal restoration. National repentance precedes national repentance. Yes, it is true the sins of the leaders are there. The sins of the people. How many leaders are there? 109 in the Senate. The sins of the people are even more than the sins of leaders. So the first key is this. We must be agents of repentance. Prioritizing personal repentance, corporate repentance in the land. You know Why? Righteousness exalts a nation. Give them scripture. But sin is a reproach to a people. Righteousness exalts a nation. Sin is a reproach to a people. In this, I told you the story of Geneva, Switzerland, and how that through the ministry of John Calvin, an emphasis on integrity, probity, righteousness began to take up what, what is called a Puritan ethic took over the entire territory to the point where people started saving their money there, including the corrupt people. Everybody, every thief knew who to give money to. That, are you there? Righteousness exalts a nation. Sin is a reproach. So the first key will be to come at things with personal repentance and corporate repentance. And may God forgive our land. He's saying, of course, if we turn from our wicked ways, then God will heal the land. The second thing I want to say to you if you're going to bypass a national captivity or national recession, a national depression, is that we must pray for the land and for the leaders. I must tell you, my life has moved forward since I started praying for the land, the leaders, and the people. Daily, ladies and gentlemen, I pray for Ikeja, my, the land, the leaders, and the people. Now, many will say, but how can I pray for Tinubu? I am from, uh, I'm from uh, <laughs> Labour Party. Better pray for him. Better pray for him. So, in First Peter 2 verse 1, it says, Therefore, I exhort, first of all, that supplications, prayers, intercessions and giving of thanks be made for all men, comma, for kings and all who are in authority that we 
may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth. You see, let me explain this. When you pray for the land and you pray for the leaders, you pray for the land, you pray for the people, you do you are praying for them, the benefit is that you, the benefit is that you will live a quiet and a peaceable life. Are you seeing this? So, for instance, I am living a quiet and a peaceable life today because I am an intercessor for the land and an intercessor for those who are in authority, not a critic as it were. I am an intercessor. Amen. Not a critic. Now, people don't understand that. You see, just obey scripture. You know, forget just, if you can, you see, this thing about Bible is not a logical book. No, I didn't vote for him. He didn't say if you voted for him. Once the person now is in office, your responsibility is to invest prayer. Invest prayer in the leadership of the land, in all who are in authority, on the land. This is something I do daily. Our land did not manifest until I started praying for the land. It was when I started praying for the land. We struggled for years to find the land until I started praying for the land. That is, I was trying to get a land without investing prayer in the land. <laughs> so when I started investing prayer in the land, God gave us our land. And there's more to come. The ways of God are not the ways of man. And notice says, you will live a quiet life and a peaceable life. Please, peace in scripture is not just quietness. So peace also is prosperity. Now, he's saying there's a connection, therefore, between your prayers for the land, the people in the land, the leaders, and your prosperity. Prove it. Psalms 1, 2, 2, and verse 6. He said, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Why? They shall prosper that love thee. I will forever bless God's servant, Bishop David E. Biome, for opening my eyes to this scripture. There are many people are trying to prosper in a land they don't love. Instantly I repented. <laughs> Instantly. And the ultimate expression of love is the investment of prayer. It's not having sex though. So is investment of prayer. <laughs> so number two, to bypass the recession of a land, the, the, begin to invest prayer for the land, its leaders, and the people. Instructions this morning. Number three, to bypass the recession of a land, I recommend that you begin to bank on the promises of God because they are the basis of your escape. Please throw away every political manifesto. They have thrown it away. Do you get my point? The political manifesto was just for, it was only for political campaign. Are you getting what I'm saying here? Yeah? No political party fulfills their manifesto in reality. Let me explain why. When they wrote the manifesto, they were ignorant of the political realities. Right? So the first thing that happens is that when they now get into office, they now are faced with a dose of the reality and the first of that reality is that they cannot. The realities on ground cannot bring about the fulfillment of what they said in their manifesto. So usually the first thing that happens after they get into office is they shred the manifesto. So you can imagine if your faith, your 
plans, your agenda is based on the manifesto of a political party, you will be disappointed. Because when they get there, the reality, you until you are in the seat, you don't know what the realities are. You can only imagine, you can only assume what the are. But it is when you hit the seat and the responsibilities attached to you, then you know the reality. Then you know all the promises you made. In spite of your best, you now see the constraints of reality in making those promises. And that's why many of them begin to, you know, this is how it is. So, Instead of banking, therefore, on the promises of a government, the promise of a man, begin to bank on the promise of God, begin to accumulate divine promises because that is the basis of your escape of the national realities. Second Peter 1, 4, by which are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these we may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. What that means, therefore, is the way of escape is the promises of God. So if you lack those promises, you can't escape. So I have what in my, I have in my Bible a bank of divine promises, promises on finance, promises on this, promises on property, all manner. And I keep increasing that promise account daily. Because the promises are the basis of me encountering divine nature. I partake of divine nature and that will enable me to escape the corruption that is in the world through us. Why should you bank on divine promises? Let me give you a scripture. In Isaiah 1 verse 2, the NIV. He said, yet he, is, he too is wise and can bring disaster. He does not take back his words. He does not take back his words. So God is not like a politician. He cannot take back his words. In fact, Isaiah 4 tells us that his word will not return to him void. So when you start building your business on divine promises, you're building your finance on divine promises, you're building your family on divine promises, you're building your health on divine promises, then you can apprehend divine nature, which will enable you to escape the corruption that is in the world through laws. That's number three. Switch, begin to bank on the promises of God because they are the basis of your escape. Number four, to bypass a national recession, the fourth recommendation for you is to develop what I call an ambassadorial mindset. An ambassadorial mindset. In 2 Corinthians 5, verse 20, it says, now, then we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be reconciled to God. We are ambassadors for Christ. Now, for instance, the ambassador of the U.S. to Nigeria is not a partaker of the economic realities of Nigeria. Because every, even the water they drink, the water they drink may not be from this country. The food they eat may not be from this country. The cars they drive may not be from this country. Their security may be is likely provided from that nation, another nation, because they are ambassadors. Now, the ambassador of an external nation cannot be affected by the economy. All he does is he advises them, he says, uh, you know, you go to uh, advise you guys to do like this, you, you do like this, because he's not affected by that. In fact, let me go for that. He cannot even be arrested by the forces of that particular nation. He has what they call diplomatic immunity. In fact, the grounds of their building, that is the grounds of their building, cannot even be breached without the invitation of the head of the mission. That's why the leaders matter because it is what the leader permits that can enter in your family. It's what you permit that can enter the family. Now, when you understand therefore that you're not, that is, you can, if an if one of them does something wrong, once he steps into, you've watched movies, they may do something out there, then they start running towards the embassy. They start running towards the embassy. Hallelujah! They start running towards the embassy. They are running towards the embassy because they know that once they enter that embassy, you no matter who you are, you cannot cross the gate of that embassy or the walls of that embassy to arrest that person who has stepped in there because it's considered. To, is considered a declaration of war. Do you know what that means? It means for certain things to enter your space, eh? Now war now. 
Let me be alone. You must develop an ambassadorial mindset. All of these things are substantiated in Scripture. Colossians 1.13. He delivered us, hallelujah, from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Colossians 1.13. In John 15, he says, if you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore, the world hates you. So you are not of the world. You, he chose you out of it, but you are not of it. John tells us, you are of God, little children, and you have overcome the world. You must develop an ambassadorial mindset. When I look at the news, and I say, yeah, it's not my nation. And I said some recently, that in my nation, that the state of the nation cannot nullify the state of the kingdom. If we know what we are doing, if we know what we are doing, if we know what we are doing as ambassadors, you must develop an ambassadorial mindset. I see myself as an ambassador from heaven to the earth. I seek first the kingdom I have from and its righteousness. Of course, all these things that the Gentiles seek are, are there. So that's number four. Number five, to escape, to nullify this, you must cultivate the, a walk of faith. Now we've been saying cultivate faith. Now that dollar is 920, you have to begin to live by faith. You will have to begin to, you will need to develop your faith. Because in 1 John 5, 4, it says, for whatever is born of God overcomes the world, this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Our faith. Your faith is what will overcome this economy. If your faith is insufficient, it's not about people increasing your salary. Do you get my point? Because the people who want to increase your salary also have their own constraints. You are demanding the increase of a salary without the increase of the revenue. For an institution to increase your salary effectively without shutting down, its own revenues must be increased. Now, its revenue is under pressure and you are demanding that it should increase your salary. Where will the increase of the salary come from? Is not the salary a factor of the revenue? If the size of the revenue does not increase, how will the size of the allocation... Are you there? Salary increase. Because the size does a subset. Okay, now, if now the revenues of the institution does not increase and as a result, they cannot increase your salary in spite of your demonstration and your pressure, what do you do? You wait there and you'll be looking... That is why every man must develop his faith. For the judge shall live not on salary, but by his faith. It means, therefore, you begin to take Romans 10, 17 seriously. More than ever before, you become somebody who hears the word of God. For faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Hallelujah. And then you begin to take scriptures like 2 Corinthians 10, they say, we have the same spirit of faith. As we have believed, therefore we speak. We also believe, therefore we speak. Hallelujah. We have in the same spirit of faith. As it is written, we have believed, therefore we speak. You will begin to take the listening to the word of God seriously. You will take confession seriously. You will listen to more messages to build up, to precipitate the faith needed for you to steal that. Everything you are seeing in an environment, everything you see on the news, the price of fuel, the inflation on the economy, everything you are seeing is calling for a higher dimension of faith. It is a victory that will overcome the war. By the way, in Ephesians 6, 16, he said, this, the shield of faith is a shield that can quench every fiery doubt of the enemy. Listen to me. If you don't cultivate your faith, you're going to go under. Because faith is the only, you, you, you go, you're going to go under. Blessing somebody. Let me rush. Number five is to, to, to survive an economy such as this. You will need to cultivate your life of trust. Now, there's a distinction between the life of faith and the life of trust. There's a book there, The Life of Trust by George Muller. Uh, let me leave that. Now, the, the life of faith, when you're talking about faith, your faith is anchored on scriptures, but your trust is anchored on the nature of God. Your faith is anchored on scriptures, but your trust is anchored on his nature. Now look at why you must take your trust away from man. In Jeremiah 17, he said, 
cursed is the man who trusts a man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart departs from the law. So when you're saying, my man, this man, my guy, once you're making flesh your strength, your heart has departed from the law, he said, because of that, you will be like a shrub in the desert. Then you will now not see when good comes. But because of that, you will inherit the parched places in the wilderness in a salt land which is not inhabited. Anemosi. Kalama ne kolodosia. He now said, but blessed is Iodej Labode. His trust is in the law. Therefore, his hope is in the law. For now, let me explain this. Your trust is in the one in whom your hope is. Your trust. Let me ask you a question now. This news, what is your what is your hope? Your trust is in the one in whom your hope is in. So he says there, but he said, blessed man whose trust is in the Lord, whose hope is the Lord. So if your hope is me, your trust is in me. If your hope is in your parents, your trust is in them. If your hope is your job, your trust is the job. If your hope is in your uncle, your auntie, your trust is in them. And that is saying you will inherit, you go dry. Trust. Let me leave it alone. Blessed is that man whose hope is the Lord. For he shall be like a tree planted by the waters. He will spread out his roots by the river and will not fear when heat, when heat comes, he will not be afraid. But his leaf will be green. He will not even be anxious in the year of drought, nor will cease from yielding fruit. If this economy stops your fruitfulness and your productivity, it reveals to me that your trust was not in the law. Because it says when you are trusting in God, you, you, come, you will not cease from bearing fruit. You will continue to produce because you are producing based on the one in whom your trust is. Proverbs 3, 5 to 8 also talks about trusting in the law with all your heart. So now, when he's saying trust with all your heart, he's saying when you are trusting God, trust God wholeheartedly. Don't just trust him and then have another place. See, I look to no man in this world. No man. I'm surrounded by help. I look to no man. No man. I believe God for everything. But no man can disappoint me. God, I'm not looking to you. Hallelujah. So cultivate that life of trust by learning to look away from man. Number six, you must become what I call a covenant practitioner. You see, now, before you could say you will not do, you will not tight, you will not do covenant. Now, you have to. Because in Jeremiah 33, verse 7, you said, Thus says, Lord, David shall never want a man to sit upon the throne of the house of Israel. Neither shall the priest, the Levites, want a man before me to offer burnt offering, to kindle meat offering, or to do sacrifices continually. He said, the word of the Lord came to me concerning on Jeremiah, saying, Thus says the Lord, if you can break my covenant with the day, and my covenant with the night, that there should be no day nor night in their season. Then may my covenant be broken with David, my servant, that should not have a son to reign upon his throne. With the Levites, the priests, my ministers, as the host of the heavens cannot be numbered, neither the sound of the sea measured. So I will multiply the seed of David, my servant, and the Levites who minister unto me. Hey, he's saying for the covenant to fail. The sun must stop shining. For the covenant to fail, the moon, hallelujah, must stop shining. He anchors the validity of the covenant to the existence. Has recession stopped sun? So recession can't stop the covenant. Has recession stopped the moon? Even when there was corona, moon was shining. Sun was shining. No, no economic recession can hinder the glory of the sun and the moon. The same way. No economic recession or national recession can hinder the glory of a person who is walking in the covenant. Hallelujah. None. 
Psalms 89, for my covenant will I not break. I'm not going to break my covenant because the condition of the economy is not are you there? Covenant is supposed to climb it. We are anchored on the practice of the covenant. So what we're seeing around calls for greater fastidiousness. Now today your tithe go be accurate. Now now your profit of good accurate. Everything God says you do in every covenant God has revealed to you. It is now that the compliance with those covenant matters more. Matters more. You must be fastidious in the practice of the covenant. For his covenant he will not break. Not alter the thing that has gone out of his mouth. How do you enter covenant? Well, it's simple. Psalms 15 verse 5. Gather to me my covenants, my, my sins, who have made a covenant with me by what? Sacrifice. So you enter covenants by sacrifice. So the more you see what is happening around, the more sacrifice will matter. Sacrifice is based on covenant. And when it comes to covenants and all that, it is God, Genesis 15, who tells you what to use for the covenant. You don't just be doing what you like. Amen. So we must therefore become covenant-minded. Covenant-minded. Number seven, as I begin to round up this morning, to bypass a national recession, and a national, you must take your prophetic and pastoral partnerships more seriously. Hosea 12, 13, by a prophet, he brought Israel out of Egypt. And by a prophet, he was preserved. So, your deliverance is a function of the prophetic. Your preservation is a function of the prophetic. Believe in the Lord your God, you'll be established. Believe in his prophets, so shall you prosper. The word there in the Hebrew means to support your prophets. And you can study scripture that most of those who had their prophetic partnerships active in place survived it. You remember that woman, the widow, of Zarephath, you can study scripture. All of those people who had partnerships, hallelujah, the Shunammite woman, all of those who had partnership with the prophetic survived adverse circumstances because by a prophet, to brought out, by a prophet they were preserved. Hallelujah. Take your prophetic partnerships seriously. Number eight uh, or nine. Pray about location or relocation. So the more grievous the economy, pray about location or relocation. That is, what I mean by that is this. If before a recession or a depression, you were not sure of your location, use the introduction of that recession to confirm your location. In Genesis 26, in 2 second, second Kings 8, 1 to verse 6, Elisha spoke to the woman whose son he had restored to life, saying, Arise and go, and your household, and stay where you can, for the Lord has called for a famine. And furthermore, it will come upon the land for seven years. So here, the prophet gave her an instruction to relocate and an advanced information that a famine was going to come upon that land for seven years. So she didn't just wake up and have a brainwave. She doesn't say, my friend is going, I'm going. No, 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 no. Her relocation was prophetically inspired and prophetically instructed. The, 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 the benefit of having prophetically backed relocation is that everything she lost, if you go to verse 6, when she came back, they said to her, restore all that was hers and all the proceeds of the field from the day that she left the land until now. Listen to me. If your relocation was prophetically backed up, prophetically inspired, prophetically instructed, everything Thing you seem to have lost will be recovered. So they they recovered, she recovered everything. So it was like she didn't even go anywhere. Because after seven years, when she came back, everything that was hers and all the proceeds of the field were restored. Don't send yourself. Pray about your location and your relocation. So these are for those God moves out in a recession. But now in Genesis 26, we see another case of God that God says to stay. 
So in the case of Genesis 26, there was a famine in the land beside the first famine that was in the days of Abraham. I said, went to Abimelech, the king of uh, uh, three in Gerar, and the Lord appeared to him and said, do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land which I tell you of. Dwell in this land. And I will be with you. And I will bless you. For to you and your descendants, I will give all this land and I will perform the oath which I swore to Abraham, your father. And I will make your descendants multiply as the stars of the heaven. And I will give to your descendants all these lands. And in your seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Because Abraham obeyed my voice, my charge, my commandment, my statutes, my laws. So Isaac dwelt in Gerar. So you see here, we are not against Jack Pine. We are not against staying. Just if you are jackpine, make sure you were sent. If you are staying, make sure you are sent. Are you there? That woman relocated. I, is that so? This woman, for instance, now, this woman, 2 Kings 8, relocated under prophetic instruction. You know what happened? She was blessed. Isaac stayed. He was blessed. Naomi. Just had a brainwave. Elimelech died. The two children died. She came back empty with a single wife or one of the sons to work for somebody Boaz that didn't relocate. What matters is everybody stays in the center of the plan of God for their life. Pray about location and relocation. Lastly, don't stop building and don't Hold your projects because of the state of the nation and the economy. Jeremiah chapter 29 and verse 4, and I think my time is up. Such a strong anointing here this morning. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all who were carried away captive, whom I have caused to be carried away from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses. Don't let the captivity stop you from building. Don't let the recession eat. build houses, dwell in them, plant vineyards, eat of them, take wives, beget sons and daughters, take wives for your sons, give your daughters to the husband, to husbands, so that there may, they may bear sons and daughters, that you may be increased in the land and not diminished, and seek the peace of the city where the Lord has caused you to be carried away captive. And pray the Lord for you, for in its peace you will find peace. Don't say, eh, now we have to stop. Hey, stop that. Why he told them that in spite of the captivity in the nation, they should continue to build, they should continue to marry, whatever you wanted to do before dollar was 920, continue, stay on that project. God is your sufficiency. God is your source. God is your sufficiency. Not the economy. God. Is, so let no project in this house stop. Let no degree stop. Don't stop nothing you intend. Don't halt your plans. Don't halt your agenda. You don't halt the school you wanted to go to. Don't halt the degree you wanted to date. Don't halt the marriage. Don't postpone your marriage. Build. In spite of it, God will meet you at the point of your need. Hallelujah. We're not going to stop building. We're not going to stop advancing. We're not going to stop buying. We're not going to stop getting married. We're not going to stop building houses. We're not going to stop. We're not going to stop anything. Because we are going to do it in spite of it and the glory will belong to the Lord. So do not cease building and do not halt your projects for the sake of the recession. I pray for you this morning in the name of the Lord Jesus. What you could not do before this national recession hit, you will do more than. What you could not do when there was no inflation, you will exceed. The targets you could not meet, hallelujah, when fuel was 500, 200, 300. This season, what you could not buy, what you could not build, what you could not start, what you could not accomplish, you will accomplish much more than it in the name of the Lord Jesus. The grace of God will be sufficient unto you. In the name of Jesus, God is the sufficiency of the saints. You will not fail. You will not beg. You will not live in debt. You will not be frustrated. Your children will be well educated. In the name of Jesus, it is now that I will be 
dedicating your houses. It is now that I'll be dedicating your cars. It is now that I'll be dedicating the movement of your children abroad. It is now. Hallelujah. I release grace upon you this morning. I release grace upon you this morning. I release Nigeria won't stop you. Africa won't stop you. Canada won't stop you. US won't stop you. UK won't stop you. No nation will be able to stop what God is doing in your life because you are an ambassador of the kingdom of God. Well, this is as far as I can go this morning. Of course, we will have time to pray about these issues in the coming week. Praying about it. That no recession in any nation will be able to stop us. Glory to God. So I pray that in the name of the Lord Jesus, nothing will stop. Rather, everything will pick up pace in Jesus' mighty name. Thank you.